Hello everyone. Let's get started. Today we're going to be discussing an introduction to anatomy and physiology. The way we're going to approach this topic is to both review some old information that you probably learned in your previous coursework and to introduce some new information specific to anatomy and physiology. The first thing we'll do is define these terms, anatomy and physiology. We'll review the cell theory and the characteristics of living things, and we'll list the universal characteristics that all living cells share. We'll discuss the levels of organization found in multicellular organisms like human beings. And we'll talk about the language that we use that is specific to anatomy including directional terminology and the language of planes and body cavities. Finally, we'll discuss the concepts of homeostasis and feedback mechanisms. But let's begin with definitions. Anatomy and physiology are always taught together, and that's because these two sciences are natural cousins. Anatomy is the science of the structure of an organism. We use the term gross anatomy to discuss the structure that we can see with our naked eye and microscopic anatomy to discuss the cells and tissues that we can only see when we're looking under a microscope. These two sciences, anatomy and physiology, are always linked because they belong together. We can't understand one without the other. While anatomy examines structure, physiology examines function. Physiology is defined as the science of the interconnected functions of all of the organ systems within an organism. That tells us that anatomy and physiology are very tightly integrated. They belong together. Remember the saying that form follows function. The two things are linked. Like all multicellular organisms, human beings have a body that is extremely complex, both in its anatomy and physiology. You would think that by this time in history, we would understand everything there is to know about the structure and function of the human body. But the truth is, much is still unknown and being studied today. For example, we now know that about 30% of human beings have anatomical variation. In other words, some people have anatomical structures that are different from most of the rest of the human population. These aren't considered abnormalities, though, rather normal variations that have emerged as the result of many, many, many millennia of evolution. Over on the right-hand side of this slide, you can see an image depicting Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. I put this picture in here to remind us that human beings have been fascinated by anatomy and physiology for a long, long time. When we study the anatomy and physiology of the human body, one of the first things that we do is we organize it on different levels. The fundamental unit of the human organism, as well as all other living organisms, is the cell. Let's take a minute and review the concept known as cell theory. Remember, the cell theory was put together by many different scientists across the 18th and 19th centuries, and it has two statements within it. The cell theory tells us that all living things are made of cells, and that all cells come from previously existing cells. In other words, cells cannot just emerge out of thin air. 
they have to come from a cell that already exists and has undergone division to produce new cells. All cells come from previously existing cells, and all living things are made up of these units of life called cells. Remember that inside of a cell we're going to find all of the components that are needed to sustain life. Over on the right hand side of this slide, I've got a microscopic image of a blood smear taken from a human. These sort of pale purplish pink donut looking structures, these are red blood cells. The much darker purple structures, these are white blood cells. Notice how different they look, how much bigger they are, how they stain differently. Red blood cells and white blood cells are very different looking cells because they have very different functions to perform. Red blood cells are involved in the exchange of gas from the other cells in the body. They deliver oxygen gas and they remove carbon dioxide. White blood cells, in comparison, and these happen to be a type of white blood cell called a neutrophil, these are cells of the immune system, and they're involved in helping fight off any foreign invaders that come into the body. When we look across all different types of living things, we can see that they all share certain characteristics. Now, depending on which kind of a scientist you speak with, this list is going to vary a little bit. But generally, most scientists will tell you that a living thing has to have a certain amount of structural organization. It also has to be able to perform some level of metabolism. And if you're not familiar with that term, metabolism simply refers to all of the many chemical reactions that go on inside of an organism every single day. There are what we call anabolic reactions in metabolism, and those are reactions that build molecules. And then there are catabolic reactions in metabolism that break down molecules. Living things also are capable of growth and development. Now, growth refers to both the enlargement of a multicellular organism. Think of, a, of an infant, for example, growing into a child and then an adult. But it also refers on a cellular level to cell division and an increased number of cells inside the organism. This word development can also mean different things, but it primarily refers to how multicellular organisms tend to change as they grow. Certain structures within the body mature and take on certain functional characteristics. Living things are capable of responding to their environment. They're also capable of regulating their cellular and organ systems. And finally, living things are capable of reproducing themselves. This is perhaps the single most important characteristic of a living thing. Now, Another list that we should be familiar with is shown on this slide. This is the list of the structures, the four structures, that we can find inside of all living cells in all organisms. That's right. It doesn't matter if we're talking about a bacterial cell or a fungal cell or a palm tree or a giraffe or a human being. If we look inside the individual cells in any living organism, those cells are going to have these four characteristics at least. First of all, the cell is going to be surrounded by a membrane, what is sometimes referred to as the cell membrane, 
or the plasma membrane. Those two terms mean the same thing. Inside the cell, we're going to find a, a watery gel-like material called cytoplasm. There's going to be some genetic material inside of that cell. And on our planet, at least, that genetic material is DNA. And finally, there are going to be cellular machines inside of that cell called ribosomes. Ribosomes, remember, are the cellular structures that help perform the process called translation. Translation is the process where an RNA molecule is used to build a protein, and ribosomes perform that important work. So all cells have these four structures, regardless of what kind of an organism you're looking at. Now, inside of multicellular organisms, one of the ways that we order or organize the, the body is to discuss it in terms of its structural hierarchy. Now, what I mean by that is we talk about the body from its least complex structural level to its most complex structural level. So for a multicellular organism like a human being, the least structurally complex part of our body is the atom. Our body is made up of many, 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 many millions of individual atoms. And of course, an atom is a unit of some element. Remember, all of the elements are shown on the periodic table of the elements. So when we take these atoms of different elements and we combine them together, we create what are called molecules. That's the second order in our hierarchy. When we combine molecules together, we get what are called macromolecules. And there are four of those for us to know. The four macromolecules include protein, carbohydrate, lipid, and nucleic acid. We'll be talking more about those as we go through the semester. When we take these macromolecules in combination, we come to the order of the cell. Remember, we describe the cell as being the fundamental unit of life. All living things are made of cells. When we take cells in combination, cells that are working together, and we add to that a material called extracellular matrix, we come to what we call the tissue level. Tissues are a combination of cells, again, that are all working together towards a similar function. And they are surrounded by this extracellular matrix material. Organs, in comparison, are combinations of different tissues that are, again, working together to perform some specific function or functions. Organ systems, then, are combinations of organs working together to perform some kind of specific functions. And finally, at its, mo at its most complex level of organization, there is the organism, the combination of all of the organ systems working together. So we go from the least complex, the humble atom, into molecules, and then macromolecules, and then cells, tissues, organs, organ systems, and finally, the organism. On this slide, we're looking at a diagram of this important concept. At the upper left, they're showing us that we've got many, many, again, millions and billions, uh, really an, an, a huge quantity of individual atoms inside of our very complex human body. Those atoms join together to form molecules and macromolecules 
and then cells. Cells, the fundamental unit of life, will combine with extracellular matrix to make tissue, and different tissues will come together to make organs. Organs function together to create organ systems, and organ systems come together to create the entirety of the organism.